Welcome or welcome back to the Company of the Cat. Today's episode is the long-awaited Faith of the Seven Part 2 Electric Boogaloo. This part is somewhat different from the first one. It's a simple analysis of the Seven compared to in the European pantheons, but most importantly how these archetypes and stories help us understand stuff about many characters in the main storyline. In Part 1 I talked about the Seven and how I believe they were a fallen celestial body, the story's version of Venus with some specks of Sirius and the Seven as a religion was built around it. I would suggest seeing the first one to understand my entire thought process, but it's not necessary to be honest as I think it's easily followed without having seen the first part too. Most of our main characters have all the archetypes we see in the Seven, so I could switch up the archetypes in the thumbnail and they could still fit. I will talk about almost every POV character separately, but first let's define the archetypes. The father represents judgment. He is the A Song of Ice and Fire equivalent of the Sky Father, a term used for recurring concepts in polytheistic religions of a sky god who is addressed as a father, often the father of a pantheon and the reigning or former king of the gods. Any masculine sky god is taking the position of a patriarch within a pantheon. Gods like these are Indra, Jupiter, Perun, Perkunas, Zalmoxis, Taranis, Zeus, and Thor, gods of the sky, lightning, thunder, law, and order. So the people representing the father in our story are people that bring justice and are leaders, even though they don't always take the right decisions. They are often hot-headed, the life of the party get easily angered and are sometimes a bit too enthusiastic, fans of the opposite sex. All these are not traits that all of them have, but different characters with that archetype always have some of them. This plays a huge role in how the Andal society is structured, the Andals probably have one of the most sexist, patriarchal cultures we have seen in the series. I'm not saying that the first men were reading Simone de Beauvoir before bed, don't get me wrong, but we see that women were able to be heads and founder of houses. They could inherit, they could be queens. All of Garth's children were famous heroes, not only the males. During Aegon's conquest, the three sisters rebelled against the Arins and named a queen, Marla Sunderland. We even learned in the world book and in Fire and Blood that the whole the firstborn male is the next in line is an Andal bullshit, it was not a first man tradition nor a Valyrian one. And this is why the father is their most important aspect. Father figure characters in our story are important to the political part of the series. The main plot, along with many of the subplots, start when the father figure dying and the shit hitting the fan. John Arryn, Ned, Robert, Rickard and Tywin are very different examples of the father, but all of them in their stories and in their minds fought for justice, they were father figures and acted as leaders in most situations. Mother Goddesses represents a personifiedification of motherhood. Fertility, creation and destruction are some of their traits. They are usually the wife or feminine counterpart of the Sky Father. Dimitra, Isis, Bumi, Yerth, Pritvi, Keres, and of course Mary are all deities that are very close to what the mother represents. It is said that the mother could be fiercer than the warrior when her children were in danger. And this is something that corresponds with deities mentioned above. Dimitra was pissed when she found out what was going on with Persephone. She was not just sad, she was furious with both Zeus and Addis, and halted the seasons and living things began to die. By the way, according to the Greek ancient calendar, Persephone's time in the underworld does not correspond with the unfruitful time of the year, nor her return to the upper world with the springtime. At the beginning of the autumn, when the corn of the old crop is laid on the fields, she is reunited with her mother. Her mandatory stay to the underworld for a few months every year was most likely during the very, very dry Mediterranean summer and not autumn or winter. Back to Dimitra. She pinned a scalafos under a rock for reporting to Addis that Persephone ate some pomegranate seeds and turned the sirens into half bird monsters for not helping her daughter when she was abducted. After the wedding of Persephone with Addis, a nymph that Addis was Kai Kai with was mad that he set her aside and often brag about being better than Persephone and saying that Addis would soon come back to her and kick Persephone out of his holes. Dimitra heard that and was pissed, so she trampled Nymph and from the end sprang a lovely smelling herb named after the Nymph. Dimitra in general was a very chill goddess and the only time she became mad was when Persephone was wronged or hurt. 
Similarly, Isis too was doing whatever she could to protect and help her son Horus and her partner Osiris. Through her relationship with Horus, she became to be seen as the epitome of maternal devotion. Isis' actions in protecting her family became part of a larger, more warlike aspect of her character. Like the mother in the novels, she was fiercer than the warrior when her family was in danger. Because of Isis' role as a wife and a mother in the Osiris myth, aretologists call her the inventor of marriage and parenthood and protector of women in childbirth. Kat, Lisa and Cersei are the most apparent example of characters falling into this archetype. Now, war gods occur commonly in both monotheistic and polytheistic religions. Unlike most gods and goddesses in polytheistic religions, monotheistic deities have traditionally been portrayed in their mythologies as commanding war in order to spread religion. Something very reminiscent of the way the followers of the Seven spread the religion and how they even have orders for this exact reason. Ares and Mars are some of the first war gods that come to mind, but I wouldn't necessarily consider them that close to the warrior. Mars is heavily connected to agriculture, something we do not see with the warrior, but he was also the guardian of the Roman people, which is a warrior attribute. Ares was not very well liked by the Greeks, and there weren't many places where he was held in high regard. In general, we do not see him very often in myths, he has a limited role in Greek mythology, and when he does appear, he is often humiliated. Ares embodies the physical courage necessary for success in war, but he also personifies sheer brutality and bloodlust. From the Greek pantheon, Athena is a little closer to the warrior, I would say. Many pantheons from Indo-European mythologies have very angry and savage war gods, the closest to the warrior, in my opinion, being Vishnu. Whenever the world is threatened with evil, chaos and destructive forces, Vishnu descends in the form of an avatar to restore the cosmic order and protect Dharma. The warrior guards the little children. His main attribute is being a protector, not an attacker. I think he's closer to Michael the Archangel, at whom the faithful have long looked for protection in times of peril. Saint Michael was a fierce warrior and defender of the children of God. He was both a warrior and a protector. Sadly, the majority of the people we have in the series are the personification of the more violent war deities mentioned above, and not Vishnu or Michael, not the gallant protectors and knights from Sansa's songs. We have very few truly good and fair knights and warriors, with the most apparent one being obviously Brienne. Now, the smith is a very interesting archetype, at least for me it is the most interesting along with the maiden. Nearly every culture had a smith deity. Hasamili, Kothart, Vastrid, Da, Iphestos, Vulcan, Weyland, Ilmarinen, Teliavelis, and Svarog are only some of them. The smith god storylines often have some very particular details. One, the making of the chief god's distinctive weapon. Two, the craftsman god's association with the immortals drinking. Three, very often they had a disability, and four, they are very unlucky in love. Both in real life and in the novels, the smith represents craft and labor, and is portrayed holding a hammer. They were patron gods of blacksmiths, metalworking, carpenters, craftsmen, artisans, sculptors, farmers, cobblers, fishermen, and all of the people who labor in general. I think 2020 taught us everyone that. These people are the backbone of society and are the reason society is moving forward. The first person that had the idea to mine metal and made artifacts without any background was most likely believed to be a magician by the rest of the people. And considering that many of these deities had a disability, I think that at some point a very clever and inventive person gave solution to many of the everyday problems because he had to find a way around these problems. And that would explain the unlucky in love, not only by a romantic partner, but also his family. Because most societies at that point in history were not very accepting of people with disabilities. This archetype got into the pantheon through very hard work and clever thinking. Literal smiths in our story do have disabilities, like Donal, and do not have the best life, but they work hard to achieve their goals. They make some very important artifacts, and they were very important at some point. I think Gendry will have a very, very important role as the story progresses, and I'm quite afraid of what is going to happen to him, because I don't think he will get out of all this mess 100% okay. 
In general, Smith is the person that comes up with a solution that can help most of the people involved. Many times they have to sacrifice something in the process and it can be a person that is looked down upon for some reason, even though he is more than just useful. The Maiden, along with the Smith, are the two most underrated archetypes. The Maiden represents innocence and chastity, so it's not the Venus or Aphrodite character, but a character closer to Persephone and Sita. Both Sita and Persephone were abducted and disappeared under the earth. They went through hell and back, literally. And obviously the Maiden is very close to Virgin Mary too. The Maiden is often abducted or thrown into situations against her will, but she is also the helper. The Maiden is still strongly connected to her inner child. We see them being highly sensitive and strongly believe in the good in people. They see the world through rose-tinted glasses at first. The Maiden archetype is highly receptive and open to learning. She is great at adapting, especially when challenged, and she carries more strength than she is aware of. At first, we see them constantly daydreaming rather than stepping into action and taking control of their life. They need to learn how to take responsibility instead of wallowing in negativity. They find out the hard way that no one is coming to the rescue. They can come across as shy and insecure and are easily manipulated. We have many stories in the novels where maidens help the hero. But if you look closer, it's not just a simple help. Without them, the hero wouldn't be a hero or even alive. Legend says that Galadon's valor was so great that the maiden fell in love with him. She gave him an enchanted sword the just made to demonstrate her love to him. Elenai saved Duran, Sansa saved Dontos, the mermaid wife was helping the Grey King, and Azorahai wouldn't have his sword without his wife. The maiden is a very important piece of the solution to a problem. Lyanna gave birth to John, and in the process she lost her life. Here Lyanna is the maiden and without her John wouldn't be alive. Rhaegar on his own was not enough. The crone is the trickiest one because no one is exactly the crone except Bran and Bloodraven and maybe Queth, but we don't see her that much. People are visited by the crone. They themselves are not the crone. Bran is the only POV character that has this archetype and maybe Aaron and this is debatable. For a person to be wise, they need to be unbiased to a blank page, and I think this is the reason why this archetype is represented in our story by a kid and a very, very old dude. One has experience and wisdom, and the other is blank page, learning and trying his best, because this is what kids do most of the time. The stranger represents death and the unknown and leads the dead to the other world. The Book of the Stranger, though, according to the Septons, teaches the followers about peace. And the faceless men say the exact same thing about the many-faced god. They bring peace. Death is often a gift. Death is a merciful end to suffering. Danny is the person that most of you were curious about why I put her as the father. And my answer is because she is the most father-like person among our main characters. Daenerys started as the maiden. She was sold without her consent. She was abused, afraid, and hoped that someone would help her. But she understood very early on that the only person that can help her is herself. She became the smith when she came up with a plan for the pyre. Her solution was to sacrifice the maid. Because this is the point where Danny stopped being the maid. It didn't have to do with the loss of her virginity, but with the loss of trust for other people. That was the innocence she lost. Her solution didn't give her a sword, like in the myths, but it did give her dragons, which are her sword. Dani became the mother because she is the mother of dragons and showed compassion to the slaves, but this is where the mother archetype part of her ends. From that point on, she is taking action and she distributes justice. For the slaves, she was the mother because she was there for them, but from an outsider's perspective, she is 100% the father. She is the leader, she is taking decisions, and she is the judge. She is the hammer of justice, but instead of the hammer or a sword, she has three dragons. The slaves in Volantis are waiting for her. They know that they are gonna die, but at that point they don't care. Death is a gift and they are more than willing to receive it. And this is where Dani is gonna move to her stranger era, in my opinion. John is more tricky, because unlike Dani, the archetypes are very tangled. There are no clear lines between each other. He is getting involved in situations he doesn't like, but unlike the Maiden, 
He is active and that makes him the smith. He is trying to find solution to problems. This is his thing, solving shit. He is trying to do his best and help everyone like the smith. He is also very much unlike in love and he is somewhat of an outcast because he is a bastard. He is also a warrior, yes, but his main storyline is about giving solution to other people's problems. During his relationship with Ygritte, he was the maiden. He cares for his friend and family as a mother does, and during Slint executions, he took on the role of the father, but the smith is his strongest archetype. And as I said in a comment, Azor Ahai made and tempered the sword himself. He was the smith, not just the warrior. Arya, like Daenerys, has very clean-cut lines between the archetypes. She began as the warrior, I would say, being wild, courageous, protective, very hot-headed, and learning to fight. She even got a sword as a gift, making her the warrior and John the helper maiden. When she was taken from Yoren and later by the Brotherhood, she took the role of the maiden. Maybe not the most conventional storyline of a maiden, but still she was the maiden. Arya has the strongest sense of justice of all the Stark kids. Here making a list to restore justice is the most fatherly thing to do. But also she is the most protective of them all too. She cared for them. She cared for all her family very much and so did too. The same goes for her friends and people that she cares about. She was caring for a toddler while being a kid herself because she has a very strong protective and motherly instinct. She is also very hands-on. She is gonna find solutions herself. She is extremely clever and street smart. Attributes associated with the smith. And right now she is training to give the gift of death, making her the stranger. Brienne is one of my favorite characters in the series. I love her very, very much. Martin, I am talking directly to you. I am watching you. She is another character with easily distinguishable archetypal roles. She is the warrior maiden, the maid of Tarth. But she does represent all the archetypes, not just these two. Brienne has the best qualities of all the archetypes. And this is why I love her. She is a genuinely good person. She is dispensing justice, but she is merciful and tries to see the best in people and the world in general. But she is not blind. She can see that not everything is pink. So she tries her best to make the world a better place. Brienne kills only when necessary. She isn't cruel. And she just tries to maintain peace. She is cleaning up the riverlands and helps people in need. She is the warrior not because she is a bloodthirsty fighter, but because she is the protector. And she is the maiden because she didn't turn cruel even though people were extremely harsh towards her. She is just like the father, but merciful like the mother and kills only when necessary to bring peace. The solution she gives may not always be the best, but like the smith, smith, but like the smith, her priority is helping, even though people are not always deserving of that. Sansa, Jamie, and Tyrion fall mainly under the maiden archetype. Yes, even Tyrion. Sansa is the blueprint of the maiden, and this is why I'm not going to talk about her a lot. Everything I said about the maiden also applies to Sansa. She began as a dreamer with rose-tinted glasses on, she was manipulated, and she was naive. But through all the crap she's going through, she's going to get stronger and take control of her life. Jamie is also the maiden and not the warrior. It's not the most orthodox way to write a maiden storyline, but it is definitely a maiden one. Jamie was manipulated. People constantly took advantage of him because they could see that he cared for them and loved them. Or he was trying to prove his worth because like maidens, his biggest fear is about how other people perceive him. It doesn't help that he is not the sharpest tool in the shed either. Ever since he was a kid, he dreamt of becoming the sword in the morning, but he didn't. And he was very disappointed in himself when he finally realized he had become anything but. It was getting to know Brienne that made him believe in being just and honorable. And this is when he actively started to act like it. In his storyline with Brienne, he is the maiden fair while she has the role of the bear. And he even gave her Oathkeeper, paralleling the maiden giving Galadon the just maid. Tyrion is a combination of the Maiden and the Smith. He is a smart cookie and he gives solutions for many problems. He also has dwarfism, something that makes him an outcast. He is very unfortunate in love and has a very bad relationship with his family, just like the various Smiths did is. Unlike the rest of the people with the Maidel archetype, Tyrion has it reversed. Unlike Sansa or Jaime, who didn't do anything and had a victim mentality, Tyrion was way more active in the beginning. 
He tried, but after all the difficulties, he decided that he is in fact the victim and the world is cruel, so he's gonna be cruel in turn. Tyrion becomes progressively worse because, let's be honest, he is not a very good guy. <laughs> Catelyn began as the mother, and she is still the mother as Lady Stoneheart. They even call her mother merciless. She is the best example of a mother archetype. Whatever I said about the mother is true about Catelyn. She is a peace mother. She doesn't seek justice, she seeks revenge. She doesn't want to bring peace by killing, she wants just to cause pain. Cersei also kind of falls under the mother archetype. In her own twisted way, she loves her family, except Tyrion. Although the reason she loves her family so much is because she sees them as an extension of herself. She's a very selfish person, and at this point she's also quite delusional. All in all, I don't think Cersei ticks the boxes for the rest of the archetypes because I don't think she is considered a hero in this story. So far the people I mentioned have flaws, yes, but I would consider them heroes. Cersei isn't one though, in my opinion. Aeron and Theon represent none of these seven archetypes, but they do embody an archetype that I will discuss in another video. The Fool. Asha has both warrior and maiden characteristics, like many of the characters I talked about. She was taken, she lost her family and people undermined her, like many of the other maidens, but she is a fighter, like the warrior, and in her love life she is definitely the warrior and not the maid. Bran is the crone, I mentioned it in the archetype section above. He is the one that sends the visions and dreams to Theon, and he brought the raven to earth when he peeked through the door of death, like the crone. Another POV character that has this role is Davos. Davos is wise and experienced, he gives advice and helps. The more street smart elements of his character, along with the problem solving, represent the smith, and it makes sense. Davos represents the common folk, and he provides labor. This is it for our today's upload. Unlike most of my videos, this one was an analysis and not a theory one. In any case, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press a like, comment your thoughts and ideas about it, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Until the next one, bye!